Stage 3. Extended Continuity of Attention and Overcoming Forgetting 3. The goal for Stage 3 is to overcome forgetting and falling asleep. Set your intention to invoke introspective attention frequently, before you've forgotten the breath or fallen asleep, and make corrections as soon as you notice distractions or dullness. Also, intend to sustain peripheral awareness while engaging with the breath as fully as possible. These three intentions and the actions they produce are simply elaborations of those from stage two. Once they become habits, you'll rarely forget the breath. Practice Goals for Stage 3 You begin Stage 3 with longer periods of sustained attention to the breath. The mind still wanders sometimes, but not for as long. Just keep practicing what you learned in Stage 2, and mind wandering will eventually stop completely. The main goal for this stage is to overcome forgetting. To do this, you'll use the techniques of following the breath and connecting to actively engage with the meditation object and extend periods of uninterrupted attention, and you'll cultivate introspective awareness through the practices of labeling and checking in. These techniques allow you to catch distractions before they lead to forgetting. You will also learn to deal with the pain and drowsiness that often arise at this stage. You have mastered stage three when you no longer forget the breath. This is also the first milestone achievement, continuous attention to the meditation object. How Forgetting Happens Our field of conscious awareness contains much more than just the meditation object. It also includes an awareness of bodily sensations and things in our surroundings, as well as a constant stream of thoughts and feelings. Any of these is a potential distraction, but an actual distraction is one that competes with the meditation object for your attention. When attention alternates between the breath and a sound, thought, feeling, or bodily sensation, flickering even briefly between the two, it's a distraction. There are typically several such distractions in your field of conscious awareness at any one time. You might not notice these movements of attention because they're so rapid. Nevertheless, this alternating attention creates a scattering of attention to distractions. These are the distractions that potentially cause forgetting. There are two distinct types of distractions, subtle and gross. The difference between the two is the amount of time attention is on the distraction versus the breath. When less time is spent on the distraction and the meditation object remains the primary focus of attention, it's called a subtle distraction. These subtle distractions, along with peripheral awareness, are what make up the background of conscious experience. However, if one of these distractions takes center stage, occupying your attention for most of the time and causing the meditation object to slip into the background, it becomes a gross distraction. As you follow the breath, attention alternates between the breath and a constantly changing variety of subtle distractions in the background. Sooner or later, a subtle distraction comes along that's engaging enough to displace the meditation object as your primary focus of attention. At that moment, the subtle distraction becomes a gross distraction, and the meditation object slips into the background. At first, your attention will alternate between the gross distraction and the meditation object, Yet, because the distraction is more compelling than the breath, your attention becomes increasingly focused on it. Eventually, attention stops returning to the meditation object altogether. Even without any attention, the breath may linger in peripheral awareness for a little while. But the longer the gross distraction occupies your attention, the more the breath fades, until you forget it entirely. Forgetting often happens gradually. But if the distracting thought or sensation is highly charged, attention can get captured quickly and intensely, and the meditation object disappears at once from consciousness. Still, whether it happens quickly or slowly, the result is the same. You forget about the breath, and you also forget what you were doing. Then, once attention tires of that distraction, it moves on to something else. 
mind-wandering begins. Overcoming Forgetting You overcome forgetting by catching distractions before they cause you to forget. To do this, you first need to extend the periods of attention to the breath so you can look introspectively at the mind and see what's happening. Extended periods of stable attention are achieved using the technique of following the breath from stage two. However, in this stage, you'll look at the breath sensations in much greater detail and will learn the related technique of connecting. The other key to overcoming forgetting is cultivating introspective awareness. This allows you to see the distractions that are about to make you forget the breath. The practices of labeling and checking in will develop this ability. Think of the untrained mind as a turbulent sea. Attention to the breath is like an anchor, making the raft we float on steady enough to stand on and look out from. When we can't hold our attention for more than a few breaths, our anchor isn't secure and the raft is shaky. Before we know it, we get swept away by a wave. Yet if we can hold our focus longer, making the raft more stable, we can see an approaching wave and maneuver in a way that lessens or avoids its impact. This analogy is helpful for understanding how extended periods of attention, along with introspective awareness, allow us to correct for distractions before they cause forgetting. Sustaining Attention Through Following and Connecting Following and connecting are tools you will use over many stages to develop greater vividness, clarity, and stability of attention. At this stage, you use them to sustain attention on the meditation object for longer periods without losing peripheral awareness. Both methods give the mind a series of simple tasks to perform, or games to play, that make following the breath more interesting. This helps counter the tendency for attention to abandon the breath for something else. Following and connecting should always be done in a relaxed manner, rather than with driven intensity. Following As you progress through the stages, you will follow the breath with ever closer attention in pursuit of ever more detail. In stage two, this meant identifying the beginning and end of both the in and out breaths, as well as the pauses separating the two. Your first goal in stage three, if you haven't reached it already, is to discern each of these with equal clarity. When you try to perceive all parts of the breath equally, it may feel like you're somehow forcing the breath to make some parts stand out more clearly. Indeed, the breath will change as a result of your observation. When you consciously intend to discern certain features more clearly, unconscious mental processes try to help by exaggerating the breath. This is perfectly all right, as long as you don't do it intentionally. This is a subtle but important point. If you didn't deliberately and consciously alter your breath, don't fall into the common trap of taking ownership of something you didn't do. When the breath changes due to unconscious processes, even though it suits our conscious purposes, you didn't do it, so don't interfere. Just notice that it has changed and keep observing everything passively and objectively, letting the breath continue as is. The sensations may also grow weaker or even disappear from one nostril or alternate between nostrils. This, too, is completely normal, and you don't need to do anything but notice it. Once you can perceive all major points in the breath cycle clearly and vividly, you need a bigger challenge. Next, you'll practice recognizing the individual sensations that make up each in and out breath. First, carefully observe the sensations between the beginning and end of the in-breath until you can recognize three or four distinct sensations every time. Continue to observe the rest of the breath cycle just as clearly as before. When you can consistently recognize several sensations with every in-breath, do the same with the out-breath. Your intention will be to follow the breath with vividness and clarity, and to be aware of very fine details. If you miss the mark, don't worry. You always have the next breath to work with. With practice, the number of sensations you recognize will increase. 
It's possible to consistently identify between four and maybe a dozen or more sensations with each in-breath, and a somewhat smaller number for each out-breath. The sensations are subtler. However, that doesn't mean you'll necessarily observe that many. The actual number of sensations you can perceive isn't that important. What matters is that your perception grows sharper, and that you stay interested in and attentive to the breath. As you progress, you may, if necessary, keep increasing the level of detail so the mind stays actively engaged. Even as you engage more closely with the breath, it's very important to also maintain extrospective awareness. This may not be easy. When you focus closely, the mind naturally tends to drop awareness of bodily sensations and external stimuli. Don't let this happen, because you'll become more vulnerable to both forgetting and drowsiness. Furthermore, emphasizing both attention and peripheral awareness at the same time increases the total power of consciousness. More conscious power is the key to making progress in later stages. Finally, when you allow for the full range and content of awareness, there's great potential for insight, even at these early stages. You're not only observing the breath, but watching and learning from the activity of your mind as a whole. Connecting Once you can clearly discern and easily follow the sensations of the breath, we may need a new challenge to engage your attention. This is why we introduce connecting here, even though it's a more advanced technique. Connecting is an extension of following that involves making comparisons and associations. As you follow the entire breath cycle, begin connecting by observing the two pauses closely and notice which is longer and which is shorter. Next, compare the in and out breaths to each other. Are they the same lengths or is one longer than the other? When you can compare the lengths clearly, expand the task to include relative changes over time. Are the in and out breaths longer or shorter than they were earlier? If the in breath was longer than the out breath, or vice versa, is that still the case? Are the pauses between the in and out breaths longer or shorter than they were? Is the longer of the two pauses still the same as before? Once you reach stages four and five, your introspective awareness will have improved enough that you can start connecting the details of the breath cycle to your state of mind. When you find the mind agitated and there are more distractions, ask yourself, is the breath longer or shorter, deeper or shallower, finer or coarser than when the mind is calm? What about the length or depth of the breath during a spell of drowsiness? Do states of agitation, distraction, concentration, and dullness affect the out-breath more or in a different way than they do the in-breath? Do they affect the pause before the in-breath more or less than they affect the pause before the out-breath? In making these kinds of comparisons, you're not just investigating the breath to sharpen and stabilize your attention. You're also learning another way to detect and become more fully aware of subtle and changing states of mind. You'll continue using following and connecting in stages four and five, so don't set your expectations too high right now. You may even find connecting isn't particularly useful at this stage. We describe it here only because there are some who will benefit from using it sooner. Following and Connecting in Silence In stage two, I said it can be helpful to use mental self-talk when following the breath. By now you've noticed that a lot of the mental activity takes the form of inner dialogue. Like a sports commentator discussing the plays in a game, mental talk becomes a way to follow the movement of attention and gauge the quality of awareness. Yet you may have also noticed that self-talk can cause problems. It's slippery, like quicksilver, flowing from investigating the breath to some other associated topic, then on to another. Suddenly you've gone down the rabbit hole of mind-wandering. Therefore, even though occasional self-talk is fine, it's best at this stage to start cutting back on verbal commentary and to appreciate the peaceful silence surrounding the breath. You'll discover you can still follow what's happening and that you're able to think about the meditation object non-verbally. Cultivating Introspective Awareness Through Labeling and Checking In So far, 
You've worked on developing extrospective awareness, and you want to sustain that. Now it's time to start cultivating introspective awareness as well. With introspective awareness, you're aware of what's happening in your mind as you continue to focus attention closely on the breath. You'll train and strengthen your capacity for introspective awareness through the practices of labeling and checking in. Labeling Up to now, you've relied on spontaneous introspective awareness, or what we've called the aha moment, to alert you to forgetting and mind-wandering. When you positively reinforce these spontaneous realizations, awareness learns to catch mind-wandering faster and faster, so that now your mind only wanders for a few seconds. However, your awareness probably isn't strong enough for you to recall what distraction was occupying your attention before your aha moment. You have enough conscious power to wake up, but not enough to know what was going on in the mind. It's like when someone suddenly asks you what you're thinking about, but you just can't remember. To strengthen introspective awareness, use labeling to practice identifying the distraction in the very moment you realize you're no longer on the breath. For example, if you catch yourself thinking about your next meal or something that happened yesterday, give the distraction a neutral label, such as thinking, planning, or remembering. Simple, neutral labels are less likely to cause further distractions by getting you caught up in the labeling. If there was a series of thoughts, only label the most recent one. Also, always avoid analyzing distractions, which only creates more distraction. Once you've labeled the distraction, gently direct your attention back to the breath. Often the last thing you were thinking about when you woke up from mind-wandering wasn't what initially took you away from the breath. However, as mind-wandering happens less often, the distraction you identify and label in that moment will be the same one that caused you to forget. Eventually, the practice of labeling will strengthen your introspective awareness enough so you can consistently identify which distractions are most likely to steal your attention in the first place. Introspective awareness will eventually be strong enough to alert you to a distraction before forgetting happens. Checking in the second part of cultivating introspective awareness involves checking in using introspective attention. Instead of waiting for introspective awareness to arise spontaneously, as you've done until now, you intentionally turn your attention inward to see what's happening in the mind. Doing this check-in requires longer periods of stable attention. That's why following and connecting are so important at this stage. These techniques give you more stable attention, making it easier to momentarily shift attention and see what's happening in the mind. Yes, checking in disrupts your focus on the breath, but when you pause to reflect on everything happening in your mind, attention needs to shift. At this stage, this is not only completely okay, it's actually the key to cultivating introspective awareness. What you're really doing is training and strengthening introspective awareness by using attention, making awareness of the mind's activity a habit. Remember from the first interlude that peripheral awareness filters through an enormous amount of information and selects what's relevant for attention. But attention also trains peripheral awareness to know which things are important. For example, if you take an interest in sports cars, after a while, every sports car catches your eye. In this case, if you take attentive interest in what's happening in your mind, in particular whether or not gross distractions are present, you're training awareness to alert you to their presence. Checking in not only strengthens introspective awareness, but also allows you to correct for gross distraction before it causes forgetting. It's like you're intentionally shifting your attention to take a snapshot of the mind's current activity to see if some distraction is about to make you forget. When you notice a gross distraction, tighten up attention on the breath to prevent forgetting. It may also help to take a moment to label the distraction before returning to the breath. Always check in very gently and briefly, turning your attention inward to evaluate how much scattering was just occurring. Is gross distraction present? If so, you know you are about to forget the breath. 
When you recognize a gross distraction before it completely captures your attention, return your attention to the breath and sharpen up your focus. That will keep you from forgetting. Sometimes just identifying a gross distraction as a gross distraction is enough to make it dissipate. If it doesn't, engage with the breath as fully as you can until it does. If it keeps returning, just keep repeating this simple process. Train yourself to check in regularly with introspective attention. To start, try every half-dozen breaths or so, but don't start counting them. Checking in should become a habit. Each time you check in with attention, you strengthen the power and consistency of introspective awareness. Also, the more often checking in leads to discovering gross distraction and tightening up your focus, the less often you will forget the breath. Putting the Practices Together Each practice, by itself, strengthens introspective awareness, but they also work together to overcome forgetting. The labeling of distractions trains awareness to know which distractions to watch out for in the future when you're checking in. You could say labeling teaches introspective awareness to recognize the faces of your abductors, those dangerous distractions that steal your attention and cause you to forget. When checking in, you can also use labeling. If you check in and notice that a distracting thought, memory, or emotion was about to take you away, you can give it a simple label and re-engage with the breath until the distraction fades. But remember, you aren't trying to eliminate distractions entirely from awareness. As long as they stay in the background, let them come, let them be, and let them go. If you practice diligently, by the time you reach stage four, you'll have completely stable attention and be able to keep watch over the entire horizon of the mind with introspective awareness. Pain and Discomfort As we start sitting longer, pain and other unpleasant sensations, such as numbness, tingling, and itching, appear. Our bodies aren't used to staying still. When we're fairly stationary in daily life, we still move and fidget. Even when sleeping, we constantly change positions to stay comfortable. The good news is it gets easier to sit still over time. The better news is that eventually you won't have any physical discomfort at all. In fact, sitting still becomes so deliciously pleasant that it takes an act of will to move. But getting accustomed to true stillness takes time and practice. Therefore, always make yourself as comfortable as possible and adjust your posture to minimize discomfort. When unpleasant sensations arise, ignore them as long as you can. Resist the urge to move for relief. When the discomfort becomes too much to ignore, turn your attention toward the pain and make it the focus of your attention. Remember, when training the mind, you always want to intentionally choose the focus of your intention. So, whenever a distraction grows too strong to ignore, whether it's pain in the body or the sound of a jackhammer outside the window, you purposely make it into your meditation object. Observe the unpleasant sensation without moving for as long as you can. If it disappears or decreases enough to be ignored, return to the sensations of the breath. If, instead, the urge to move becomes irresistible, decide in advance when you'll move for example, at the end of the next outbreath, exactly what movement you'll make, for example, move your leg or raise your hand to scratch the itch, and then be very observant as you perform that movement. After you move, the discomfort often returns quickly or reappears elsewhere. When you see this keeps happening, you'll become less concerned with moving because you realize there's no point. It becomes easier to stay with the pain and investigate it longer. We'll discuss meditating with pain and discomfort more in Stage 4, when they're even more distracting. For now, just remember that by meditating on these harmless sources of pain, we gain insight into the nature of desire and aversion by watching how resistance and impatience create suffering. As you progress, you will discover a profound truth. In life, as in meditation, physical pain is unavoidable but suffering of every kind is entirely optional.
dullness and drowsiness. Once you start to have longer periods of stable attention, you will face the problem of drowsiness and falling asleep. Why does dullness arise right when our concentration starts to improve? The first reason is that when we meditate, we intentionally turn the mind inward. But we've been conditioned our entire life to associate turning inward with going to sleep. The second is that as we succeed in taming the mind and calming its normal state of relative agitation, the overall energy level drops. There is a famous Buddhist simile of training a young elephant by tethering it to a stake. At first the elephant lunges in every direction, trying to escape. When it realizes it can't, it lies down and goes to sleep. In the same way, as we tether the mind to the meditation object, we restrain its natural tendency to seek stimulation and it falls asleep. As with the elephant, the untrained mind needs stimulation to stay awake. Dullness in meditation comes in many different degrees, ranging from strong dullness, such as drowsiness, to subtler forms, like feeling a bit spaced out. Drowsiness often makes an appearance at this stage. As with distraction, dullness is another form of scattered attention. But while distraction scatters attention to other objects of awareness, dullness scatters attention to a void in which nothing is perceived at all. The dullness and drowsiness we are concerned with here are due specifically to meditation practice and need to be clearly distinguished from dullness due to other causes. Obviously, if you're fatigued by mental or physical stress, illness, or lack of sleep, you'll be sleepy during meditation. So regard a good night's rest as an important part of your practice. When you meditate also makes a difference. Most people get drowsy after eating or strenuous physical activity, and the early part of the afternoon or late evening can be sleepy times as well. If you're well rested and have taken all these other factors into account but still find yourself getting drowsy, you'll know it's dullness related to meditation. Working with Drowsiness in meditation, drowsiness usually leads to brief moments of sleep. Within a few seconds of falling asleep, postural muscles relax and your head nods or your body starts to fall. Then you wake up with a sudden jerk as muscle reflexes pull you upright, the so-called Zen lurch. Of course, if you're lying down or sitting in a comfortable chair, you might sleep for a long time. This is why you shouldn't meditate in these positions unless arthritis or some other health condition absolutely requires it. If you've just jerked awake, within a short time you'll probably feel dullness setting in again, like a heavy cloak. When this happens, you have a great opportunity to investigate how dullness develops and turns into drowsiness. If you closely observe what happens, you'll notice that coming out of drowsiness is distinctly unpleasant. You would probably prefer to stay there. However, by resisting the urge and returning to the practice, you'll usually experience a comfortable state where you can still follow the breath, though without the same intensity or vividness or clarity as before. This is called subtle dullness. It eventually leads to strong dullness, in which attention still clings to the breath, but the focus is weak and diffuse and the sensations vaguely perceived. The drowsiness that precedes falling asleep feels like trying to see through dense fog. The breath often becomes distorted, transformed by dreamlike imagery, and nonsensical thoughts start drifting through the mind. Eventually you do fall asleep. Working with subtle dullness as it arises can be quite productive, but struggling against strong dullness that's already present doesn't work well. So, if you're drowsy or have already dozed off during a session, you must first rouse the mind out of dullness. Then you can work with dullness as it starts to return. Here are a few antidotes, roughly in order of strength, from mild to strongest, for rousing the mind from dullness. Take three or four deep breaths, filling the lungs as much as possible, and hold for a moment. Then exhale as forcefully and completely as possible through tightly pursed lips. Tense all the muscles in your body until you begin to tremble slightly. Then relax. 
Repeat several times. Meditate while standing up. Do walking meditation. Worst case scenario, get up, splash cold water on your face, then go back to practicing. These work because they stimulate you, not only physically, but mentally as well, by increasing the flow of external stimuli into your mind. In general, always do whatever is necessary to re-energize yourself back to a state of alert awareness. When drowsiness returns quite soon after you've roused yourself, it's called sinking, which feels like being caught in mental quicksand. Sinking is a sure sign that you didn't re-energize the mind enough. Keep using stronger antidotes until the drowsiness doesn't return for at least several minutes, but try not to do more than necessary, or you'll create a state of agitation. Now that you have roused your mind, keep it alert and energized by making sure your extrospective awareness doesn't collapse. Recall that dullness results from turning the mind too far inward and losing energy from lack of stimulation. If you find that focusing on the breath is causing extrospective awareness to fade, you can correct this by expanding awareness to include bodily sensations, sounds, and so forth, while not losing attention on the breath. However, you can also let the breath become secondary to a state of expanded, all-encompassing awareness for a little while. When you feel alert again, bring the focus of attention back to the sensations at the tip of the nose. You're looking for a balance between being too inward and too outward directed. Another way to keep the mind energized is through intention. Holding a strong conscious intention to clearly perceive the breath sensations while also sustaining peripheral awareness will keep the mind energized. The intention should be set before the sensations actually appear. This keeps you attentive. But don't project too far ahead. For instance, set your intention at the pause before the outbreath to observe the very beginning of the outbreath. At the beginning of the outbreath, set the intention to observe sensations near the middle, and at the middle, set your intention to discern the end of the outbreath. Do the same for the inbreath. This close up investigation takes practice. However, it energizes the mind and keeps you engaged enough so you don't as easily slip into drowsiness. Remember, it's always best to recognize and correct for dullness before it gets too strong. Introspective attention and eventually introspective awareness are what alert you to dullness before you get drowsy and fall asleep. So each time you check in for gross distractions, look for dullness as well. Also, keep in mind that your intention isn't just to get rid of sleepiness, but to learn about the nature of dullness. Therefore, Follow the breath, and when dullness arises, consider it an opportunity to learn and practice. In time, through effort and training, dullness will naturally disappear. Conclusion You have mastered stage three when forgetting and mind-wandering no longer occur, and the breath stays continually in conscious awareness. This is a whole new pattern of behavior for your mind. The mind still roams but it's tethered to the meditation object, never getting too far away. The unconscious mental processes that sustain attention never entirely let go of the meditation object. Because attention no longer shifts automatically to objects of desire and aversion, you can purposely hold your attention on an emotionally neutral object like the breath for extended periods of time. The ability to continuously sustain attention on the meditation object is remarkable, so take satisfaction in your accomplishment. You can now do something that most people can't, something you may not have thought you were even capable of. Congratulations! You have reached the first milestone achievement and the real beginning of skilled meditation. Third Interlude How Mindfulness Works the practice of mindfulness leads to both psychological healing and profound spiritual insights. To understand how, we first need to look at the role of the mind in the formation of personality. Who we are today was shaped by our past. The imprints of past experiences exert a powerful influence on our emotional reactions and behavior in the present. Usually, we're not even aware of their effect. 
Think about how much of daily life actually consists of mindless, automatic behaviors driven by unconscious conditioning. Of course, these are intermingled with intentional actions. If an automatic response isn't immediately available, we have to consciously decide what to do or say. But even these conscious choices are strongly influenced by conditioned mental states, feelings, and what are sometimes called intuitions, deeply held views about people, ourselves, the world, moral values, and the very nature of reality. All this conditioning serves as a powerful but completely unconscious influence guiding conscious decision-making processes in unseen ways. Unconscious conditioning is like a collection of invisible programs. These programs were set in motion, often long ago, by conscious experiences. Our reactions to those experiences, our thoughts, emotions, speech, and actions, may have been appropriate at the time. The problem is they have become programmed patterns, submerged in the unconscious, that don't change. They lie dormant until they're triggered by something in the present. When that happens, we often get so focused on the triggering event and our own emotions that these unconscious programs don't take in any new information about the current situation. That's why they don't change. The practice of mindfulness works because it provides new information to these programs. But how much reprogramming happens depends on our degree of mindfulness. In other words, mindfulness has different levels of application. At its most basic level, mindfulness is simply about moderating behavior. The magic of mindfulness, its power to transform you as a person, only starts working when we move beyond the first level. At the second level, by maintaining more powerful mindfulness for longer periods in daily life, we become less reactive and more intentionally present. The third level entails reprogramming the deep conditioning that has shaped our personality and only occurs in meditation. The fourth level is the radical reconditioning of the innate tendencies that create all our suffering and only occurs through insight experience. Level 1. Moderating Behavior over and over, specific situations in daily life happen to trigger our programmed patterns of behavior. For example, if your partner, or even a stranger, says something that pushes one of your buttons, you may become angry or annoyed. Without mindfulness, we react emotionally, instead of responding rationally and intentionally. Often, we just create more problems for ourselves. At the very least, we end up in a bad mood and become less effective at whatever we're doing. But if we can stay mindful, we'll also be calmer and not react as quickly or be so distracted by our own emotions. This allows us to be more attentive to our feelings and aware of the situation and the potential consequences of our actions so we can regulate our behavior in positive ways. Just being aware that our suffering has more to do with our emotional reactions than with what triggered them can help us let go of those negative emotions more easily. Mindfully acknowledging our emotions and taking responsibility for our reactions lets us recognize more options, choose wiser responses, and take control of our behavior. Awareness in the present moment allows us to slow down and change our behavior, but it doesn't make any permanent changes. The next time we're in a similar situation, we'll behave in the same automatic, reactive way. Unless, of course, we're mindful once again. Level 2. Becoming Less Reactive and More Responsive Everyone would like to make smarter choices. However, healthier responses to life situations are only one of the benefits of attention and awareness working together. The true magic of mindfulness is something completely different, producing extraordinary spiritual and psychological transformations. That's why therapists now use mindfulness training to help treat all kinds of emotional and behavioral problems, such as stress, anger, phobias, compulsive behaviors, eating disorders, addiction, and depression. The magic of mindfulness allows these people to overcome the psychological root of their problems. Thus, people who have cultivated mindfulness are more attuned and less reactive. 
They have greater self-control and self-awareness, better communication skills and relationships, clearer thinking and intentions, and more resilience to change. How does this magic work? When attention isn't so totally captured by the intensity of the moment that awareness fades, we are able to observe ourselves more closely and consistently. Attention and awareness provide the unconscious mind with new, real-time information that is directly relevant to what's happening right now. Unconscious processes are informed that the reactions they're producing aren't appropriate in the current situation, harming more than helping. With this new information, reprogramming can happen at the deepest levels of the unconscious. And the longer we can be mindful in a particular situation, the more new information becomes available, and the more mindfulness can work its magic. However, the magic of mindfulness doesn't end with the event itself. Consciousness can continue to pick up on and communicate the consequences of the event and their effects on our mental state long afterward. So the duration of mindfulness is important, as is consistency. The more consistently we can apply mindfulness to similar situations in the future, the more its magic can change our conditioning. Whenever some event triggers one of our invisible programs, we have the chance to apply mindfulness to the situation so our unconscious conditioning can get reprogrammed. Anytime we're truly mindful of our reactions and their consequences, it can alter the way we will react in the future. Every time we experience a similar situation, our emotional reactions will get weaker and be easier to let go of. We can respond mindfully to the actual situation rather than reacting mindlessly. As we grow less reactive, we are empowered to respond more objectively and conscientiously. Eventually, those skillful qualities become our new conditioning. But what if our emotions and past conditioning are so powerful in the moment that we can't change how we feel and act? That's all right. As long as we stay mindful enough, we give our unconscious processes new information, and we will be more successful in the future. With repeated effort, we will become less reactive, maybe without even realizing it. Even if we lose mindfulness completely in the heat of the moment, we can still use it afterward to reflect on what happened, our reactions, and their impact on ourself and others. By recalling the events vividly, examining them honestly and non-judgmentally, it will begin the process of reprogramming, which in turn makes it easier to stay mindful in the future. This is quite different from what usually happens. Because it's always painful to revisit a situation that made us uncomfortable, we typically like to put it out of our minds. Or, if we can't, we try to justify what we did and place the blame elsewhere. This keeps vital new information from reaching our unconscious mental processes. Mindfully examining our actions also means that we look objectively at our feelings about how we acted. We may see that we feel guilty, for example, and acknowledge that feeling guilty is an unpleasant consequence of our actions. But we shouldn't become submerged in that emotion. If you do find yourself getting caught up in self-reproach, you're just reacting from and reinforcing more unwholesome programming. Of course, it's much harder to stay mindful when it matters most, in difficult situations. That's why we need to intentionally practice mindfulness in everyday life, especially when it's easy, like when you're driving a car or eating a meal. Then you'll build up the skill and the mental muscle to stay mindful in the face of greater challenges. Level 3. Reprogramming Deep Conditioning In daily life, even if we're mindful every moment, Unskillful conditioning can only get reprogrammed when something triggers it. So, while it's essential to practice in daily life, mindfulness in formal meditation is even more effective because we don't have to wait for something to trigger an unconscious program to practice with. Instead, when our minds grow stable and quiet, all kinds of deep memories, thoughts, and emotions that drive our unconscious programs can come to the surface. Then they can be purified by the illuminating power of mindfulness. 
The reprogramming that occurs in meditation also transforms the way we think, feel, and act in more radical and broadly effective ways. That's because the unconscious conditioning that emerges is of a more fundamental nature, driving a wide range of reactive behaviors that would otherwise require many different triggering events. Conditioning of such a fundamental nature usually remains deeply hidden, but can surface in the stillness of meditation. Therefore, the application of mindfulness in meditation can rapidly accomplish much more than ever could be by the piecemeal process of confronting conditioning in daily life. To really understand and appreciate this deep purification of mind, it helps to consider how past experiences shape and condition our lives in the present. Recall that every experience leaves an imprint in our minds. The more emotionally powerful the experience, the stronger the imprint. Most of us have a large backlog of imprints from emotionally charged or traumatic events that don't fit in with the person we've become. These unresolved pieces of our personal history remain deeply buried in the psyche. Often they are too painful or involve too much internal conflict for us to confront and resolve head-on. The events themselves may have been forgotten, but the unconscious conditioning they left behind influences our behavior in ways we often don't recognize. Some of our conditioned reactions may help us, but many don't, and even helpful conditioning can appear at inappropriate times or in inappropriate ways. Consider, for example, the psychological challenges many war veterans face on return to civilian life when previously useful combat training gets in the way of readjusting to the everyday world. This is because whenever our past conditioning is triggered, it creates strong emotions that drive us to behave in specific ways. Each person's conditioned behavior, the way he or she typically acts and reacts, is absolutely unique. In fact, what we call personality is precisely this set of behaviors. And while having personality is a wonderful thing, most people have personality traits that aren't particularly useful. Some traits are simply harmful. But with mindfulness, we can purify that deep conditioning and change our personality for the better. This purification occurs mainly in Stage 4, but also at Stage 7. Level 4. Mindfulness, Insight, and the End of Suffering Unquestionably, the most valuable effect of mindfulness is its ability to radically reprogram our deepest misconceptions about the nature of reality and about who and what we are. Our gut intuition tells us we are separate selves in a world of other people and objects, and that our individual suffering and happiness depend on external circumstances. This may seem like common sense, but it's a misperception that comes from our innate programming and which is continually reinforced by cultural conditioning. As we practice mindfulness, however, we accumulate more and more evidence that things are very different from what we believed. In particular, the thoughts and feelings and memories we associate with a sense of self are seen more objectively revealing themselves to be constantly changing, impersonal, and often contradictory processes occurring in different parts of the mind. These are insight experiences. When mindfulness allows them to sink in on an experiential level, it profoundly reprograms our intuitive view of reality, transforming a person in a wonderful way. If we believe we're separate selves who need certain external things to be happy, we'll spontaneously act out of that territorial feeling, causing harm to ourselves and others. As paradoxical as it may seem, the craving to avoid suffering and pursue pleasure is the actual cause of suffering. But when we let go of our self-centeredness, we automatically act more objectively for the good of everybody in each situation then we will have discovered the true source of happiness and the end of suffering. This is how mindfulness overcomes sorrow and grief and brings release from all the suffering. You may be understandably skeptical about what I'm saying. You may even doubt that such a transformation is desirable. That's all right. 
Use the illuminating power of mindfulness to explore these very questions. Are you your thoughts? Are you your feelings? Keep asking these questions. As your meditation improves, you'll find out for yourself. A Metaphor for the Levels of Mindfulness Here is a metaphor to help you remember the different levels at which mindfulness works. Say you regularly walk in the countryside, along a narrow trail with a thorn bush growing alongside it. As you start practicing mindfulness, you become present enough in daily life to recognize your options and moderate your behavior, so you're able to dodge the thorn bush, keeping your face from getting scratched or having a thorn rip a hole in your shirt. This is the first level of mindfulness. Yet the thorn bush will still be there, and if you aren't mindful tomorrow, you'll get snagged then. In other words, nothing changes in the long term. There is no magic involved in this kind of mindfulness. The magic only starts when mindfulness begins to work at the second level. When you're mindful enough in daily life, and for long enough and often enough, then consciousness can communicate the actual context and consequences of your conditioned reactions to their unconscious sources. This produces real change. It's like trimming the branches of the thorn bush hanging across your path. However, it can take a lot of trimming to clear the path, and new branches are always growing to replace them. This thorn bush has many trunks that grow from a single root. The special magic of the third level of mindfulness, the kind that happens on the cushion, is like cutting off an entire trunk at the root. When it's gone, all its branches and thorns go with it, not just the ones that happen to grow into your immediate path. And every time you purify an aspect of your deep conditioning in meditation, another major trunk is removed. Yet if the tree's root still survives, new trunks can grow back. Unless you remain vigilant, you may find that the path once again becomes overgrown. Only the fourth level of mind.